There's a lot to love about living in a big, bright city. People, culture, late night food, but there's something missing. It's there, but you can't see it. The night sky. This is the story about a small town in Colorado. Actually, two small towns in Colorado. That are devoted to space. Westcliff has a population of 564 residents, and Silvercliff has a population of 575. This used to be a mining community, and then it evolved into a railroad community, and then into a ranching community. We are always looking to do something that will bring people into our community, and lately that seems to be we need to invest in our sky. So they made light pollution their enemy. They darkened their towns so that the night sky could become their star attraction. Have you ever seen the Milky Way that goes from horizon to horizon? 88% of the world's population has never seen the Milky Way. It's the most magnificent thing in the world. And that's what we see here. But for the towns to go dark, they needed to cover all of their lights. Not just street lamps, but the lights outside every house and ranch near town. That wasn't easy. This is a frontier town. And I can tell you, frontier people don't like being told what to do. We had to win their hearts and minds. It took 10 years. They passed ordinances, raised money to cover the streetlights, and even build an observatory. And the darker the town became, the more people saw the light. This year, the valley's dark sky was designated as one of the darkest in the world, drawing visitors from all over. Okay, might need a six pack though. <laughs> Well, I was really hoping we'd be able to see Saturn by now. Yeah, me too. That a community would decide to dim its lights and help everyone to appreciate the beauty of the night sky is an amazing thing. You come to a place like this and the stars just burst and it's remarkable. Not a lot of people are lucky enough to see the dark sky as our ancestors saw it, and I feel that we're a very special place to be able to look at the stars as people did thousands of years ago. It's a humbling thing. Suddenly you realize you can almost touch it, and you're now a part of the bigger universe. And so it's just a wonderful experience to see the dark skies, and that's what we're trying to preserve. My name's Tim Doucette. I'm an amateur astronomer. And I'm also legally blind. Kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? It turns out, I can actually see the night sky better than most people. Probably better than you. When I was younger, um, it's, it's easy to become discouraged. You know, realizing that you're never going to drive a car, uh, that you'll never be an astronaut. At least that's what you're told. I was born with congenital cataracts. They removed the lenses of my eyes and widened my pupils. That left me with only about 10% of my eyesight. For the average person, their pupil automatically adjusts for the amount of light coming in. It opens and closes. But for me, my pupil is open, so it's always letting in a lot of light. During the day, I see everything extremely bright. Everything is overexposed. Colors are, are more vivid. But at nighttime, the tables are turned, and it's like a curtain has been lifted. When I was a teenager, I went on some additional surgery to improve my eyesight. 
I got home from the hospital and I looked up at the sky and at first I thought I was actually having a detached retina. I was seeing millions of spots of light and realized that that was the Milky Way I was looking at. And it was uh, phenomenal. At first I didn't really realize what it had given me. It took 15 years later to realize that what I had was special. With my personal savings, I built an observatory on a hill near my house and called it Deep Sky Eye. When I'm looking through a telescope, I'm not wearing my glasses and my eye is like a camera without a lens. So it's focusing the light very clearly onto my retina. I see a little bit extra light that you know, most people wouldn't see. You know, you look at the Orion Nebula and you know, it looks like a fuzzy patch, but you know, I kind of get a little bit of purplish tinge to it. The sky here is like a tapestry of interstellar dust. It looks like a velvet background, you know, with diamonds all through it. It's absolutely amazing. My wife is also legally blind. She doesn't see very well at night, but most of the time when we're, you know, walking or at the observatory, I'll explain to my wife what I'm seeing. She appreciates the night sky, even though she doesn't see it very well. When I look through the telescope or look up at the night sky, it makes you realize really that all your problems with the fact that you're legally blind or, or whatever, it, it really just doesn't matter. You realize that you're a part of this universe. My biggest thing that I like to do is discover stuff and not necessarily things that have already been discovered. I really like to discover things that haven't been discovered yet. If you take an asteroid and you discover an asteroid, for example, even though there's half a million of them out there, that's one you found. Nobody else in the world knew about that asteroid before you saw it. What I've been doing here lately, and, and for about 15, 16 years now, I've been working with near-Earth objects. My observations contribute to making sure that we don't have something coming up that's gonna fall on our heads. Kind of first got into it probably 10, 12 years old. I was begging, begging, begging to get a telescope. But, and you know, we were in a very rich family, so it took a while to get it. And one Christmas I got a telescope. Then I started using it and then I got aperture fever. Uh, you want bigger telescopes all the time. So I started learning how to build them. I learned how to, how to work in a machine shop. I, and I can build things that I wanted to build. And a lot of that was astronomy parts. I kind of modified my life to fit this study, this kind of lifelong study. Sandlot is a, a very tiny little observatory. It's only 10 foot by 10 foot wide. The telescope I built uh, over a period of about a year and a half, and it may not look very polished, it works really well. I'm good with that.
I, have, I don't have a degree in astronomy. I have a passion for astronomy, and I've done it for many, many years, and I've, I've contributed, I think, to the scientific body of astronomy. Listen. This sound is the first evidence of the Big Bang. And this is a story of two radio astronomers who discovered proof of the beginning of everything. This is the horn reflector antenna at Bell Laboratories. Robert, can you tell us what this thing does? It receives radio waves coming from the direction it's pointed to and funnels them into a receiver. That's Robert Wilson, radio astronomer. In the early 60s, he and his colleague Arno Penzias were tasked with measuring the brightness of the sky using the horn reflector antenna. But no matter where they pointed it, the antenna read a much larger signal than the pair expected. Our immediate reaction was that there must be something wrong with our system. They thought it might be interference from the horn itself, or New York City, or even some pigeons living in the horn. You know, we thought about a collection of ordinary sources that are in the very distance. That just didn't seem to be possible. So they reached out to a group of researchers at Princeton University led by astrophysicist Robert Dickey, who had been scouring the sky unsuccessfully for evidence of the Big Bang. Arno called and... Dickey picked up the phone and they started hearing things like atmospheric radiation, sky brightness, all the things that they were working on. Dickie put the phone down and said, boys, we've been scooped. Robert and Arno had measured what Dickie and his team were searching for, the elusive cosmic microwave background radiation. He thought about a Big Bang source of the universe, realized that it would be very hot and therefore full of radiation, and as the universe expanded, that radiation would simply cool. And whereas it was extremely hot to start with, by now it would simply be microwaves. Now it's so cold that it would just be radio waves. And this, not pigeons or the noisy city, was exactly what had been causing headaches for Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias. The two groups of researchers from Bell Labs and Princeton each wrote complementary research papers with their findings. They wrote one about the theory, we wrote one about our measurement, and we published them. I think unlike many changes that occur in science, uh, there really was a paradigm shift with very little pushback. It was huge. There was now evidence of a new theory for the beginning of the entire universe. Over a decade later, Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias were awarded the 1978 Nobel Prize in Physics. How'd that feel, Robert? Felt pretty strange to win the Nobel Prize. I didn't feel comfortable being on the same lifts with Einstein. But despite Robert's humility, there's no doubt of the significance of the discovery. It gives us our earliest picture of the universe from which we can extrapolate back to very early times. Part of who we are as a species, to ask the question of where are we, where did we come from, where are we going, and are we going there alone? The largest mirrors in the world enable a chance for all of us to answer those questions that mean so much to us. My name is Patrick McCarthy, and I'm the principal astronomer behind the Giant Magellan Telescope Project, the largest telescope in the world, handcrafted start to finish here at the University of Arizona. The process of making a mirror, in some sense, it's like making a cake. First thing is you get all the ingredients. We have the glass. We build the mold, and we put the glass on top. And then you put it in the oven. It's then heated up to such a high temperature that the glass melts till it follows into the mold and makes the rough shape of your cake. Now, in our case, the icing is the hard part. The mirrors weigh about 17 tons. They're up to 8.4 meters in diameter. That's a really big piece of glass. 
Then to turn that piece of glass into a final optics takes another two to three years of precision grinding and polishing and testing. Each mirror from start to finish takes roughly seven years to produce and there's roughly a hundred people working on it, so about 200 person years that go into making one of these mirrors. The Giant Magellan Telescope will be sighted in the Chilean Andes. They have the sharpest images in Chile, dry weather, clear skies, and no artificial lights. It's a perfect place for astronomy. The challenge, of course, is how do you handle this beautiful precision piece of glass? And so we lift it with suction cups. The mirrors are moved very carefully because they are glass after all. Telescopes are our vehicles of discovery. There are ships in the universe, and the heart of the telescope is the mirror. It's a thing that collects the light that's come from millions or billions of light years away and brings us that information that can allow us to answer those questions. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Are we alone?